Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Shakespeare. We continue our discussion of uh, Shakespeare's uh, uh, masterpiece, uh, Hamlet. And uh, uh, today we move to probably the most uh, dramatic uh, scene of all, uh, except probably what happens in the last in the last scene. This is where the play turns from. Uh, uh, talking and speaking and soliloquizing into action. This is the fruit of Hamlet's uh, plan. This is where uh, Hamlet uses the play uh, to try to prove, uses the play to get to uh, to get some uh, hard evidence uh, to indict his uncle, uh, to prove that his uncle did indeed murder uh, King Hamlet. This is again where Hamlet says, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. We are in act three uh, uh, scene two, uh, the, uh, a very, very famous uh, part of Hamlet, uh, usually known as the play within play scene in which uh, Shakespeare uh, loved subplots to insert uh, a subplot to the uh, uh, to the play to slow the action a little bit sometimes to create some parallel uh, story plot uh, so people can compare and, and and contrast and in in some in, in a way that many critics of Shakespeare uh, uh, you know dislike or hate uh, Shakespeare uses a play inside a play in many ways this is interesting but in my opinion, the most significant thing about this play within play scene is that it, uh, it, it, Shakespeare wants us to forget, at least for a moment, that this is a play, this is something on the stage. Because the people we are observing are watching a play. We are watching a play. As audience, we are watching a play in which a group of people act as audience to watch another play. And in a sense, Shakespeare wants us to think that this is real life. You're watching people, watching people. And don't forget, uh, Hamlet was watching his, uh, his uncle and also his mother, as we're going to see. So Hamlet is watching his uncle and his mother watch a play. And probably Horatio is also watching King Claudius and he's also watching Hamlet. And as audiences, we are torn between what to watch. Are we going to watch the play itself being played or the king and the queen and their reactions or Hamlet or Horatio? In, in many ways, personally, I, I, I feel more interested in watching Hamlet. And this creates this interesting series of people watching people. So we watch Hamlet, watch, Claudius and Gertrude watch, watch the play. We'll see how this is going to develop in this very interesting uh, scene in, in, in the play, very uh, often criticized by critics as irrelevant, as simplistic, as childish, we're going to see. Uh, so we have, this is divided into several uh, uh, parts in a sense. It opens with Hamlet coaching and teaching the actors uh, how to recite and how to act, what to do and what not to do. And this reveals again Hamlet's passion or what, what I would say Hamlet's Shakespearean interest and knowledge of, of the theater. And this is one reason why many people think that Hamlet is probably Shakespeare and, or there is a lot of Shakespeare in Hamlet than in any other play. So Hamid reveals when he meets Horatio, we see how he, again, he comes to life again. He remembers the only person that is trustworthy around. Hamlet tells uh, uh, Horatio about his plan and asks him to watch uh, the king to observe his body language. Hamlet chooses to sit in a place where he can watch uh, the king and the queen. At the same time, he sits next to Ophelia. And this, is, this indicates several things, but sadly, he keeps insulting her, taunting her, and verbally uh, abusing and harassing, harassing uh, keeps harassing and uh, uh, abusing Ophelia verbally at least. And Ophelia shows 
a, a glimpse of, of resistance, I would say, in the way she replied to Hamlet's uh, puns and wordplay with puns and wordplay and make, mocking him uh, sometimes. <clears throat> the play begins and then we'll see what, how things go and then Hamlet ends with a short uh, soliloquy uh, and then he goes, we, we, we'll see how the king and the queen get very angry and we'll see why and how and then Hamlet was supposed was summoned by his mother. He leaves this promising us to go talk to her mother but he, he said, I'll, I'll talk daggers to her, but use none. I'll talk, uh, my words will be like a knife, like a sword, but I'm not going to use one. Is he not going to use one? So this advice to the actors is, is interesting. It's Shakespearean in, in a sense. and shows Hamlet's passion for, for the theater and for acting. Uh, uh, how much of this is realistic? How much of this was Shakespeare himself applying? We don't know, we're not sure, but many times Shakespeare was criticized for overdoing things, for being melodramatic, for exaggerating things. In, in your book, the book you have, the commentary and criticism says, say that Shakespeare is, uh, is actually parodying Marlowe, and I would agree, and other contemporary dramatists of the time. But maybe not necessarily Marlowe, because he was dead by then, assuming that he, he died or assuming that there was a Marlowe. Uh, and at the same time, Hamlet, uh, in Hamlet here, we have Shakespeare parodying himself, self-parodying himself, I would say, uh, uh, where he is criticizing himself, telling critics and others that I know that I'm not perfect, perhaps, that I know that there could be some problems here and there, and I know these problems, but a drama is a drama, and a drama is supposed to be melodramatic, supposed to exaggerate life so people could enjoy it, so people can relate in, in a sense. It doesn't have to be 100% realistic like later on in the, in, in the novel. So interesting advice, be not too tame neither. Let your own discretion be your tahafur, your own tutor, soothe the action to the word, and the word to the action. Wow, what a beautiful thing uh, to say here. And later on, he uses his very famous expression that I, I, I love to quote all the time. How this, the drama, the performance, all literature could be like holding a mirror up to nature. Like holding a mirror, being realistic. It, not, no drama can be realistic, at least at the time of Shakespeare. But this is a beautiful expression from Shakespeare himself and from Hamlet telling us how literature should mirror life in a sense. And he gives an interesting comment about clown. People loved clowns even in tragedy sometimes because they are wise. And at the same time, they are uh, 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 funny. They keep cracking jokes here and there. And he says, be careful. When somebody plays the, 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 the clown, speak no more than is sit down for them. When those who play the clown should stick to their role, should not do more than this. Uh, so as your book suggests here that this is perhaps Shakespeare uh, 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 criticizing his, uh, his contemporaries, accusing them of exaggerating, telling them I'm not, I'm not like them, I'm more realistic than, than they are. Uh, necessarily uh, Marlowe, I was mentioning here somebody else, Edward Elyane, a leading tragedian who was very famous for his overblown gestures and melodramatic style of, of, of del uh, delivery. Uh, the, the, the exaggeration we're talking about here, the too much drama could be suitable for the kind of drama others wrote like, like Marlowe. But for Shakespeare, the flexibility, the, 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 the shift from verse to, to prose uh, and other things, required because it, it was closer to conversational English uh, than Marlowe's uh, uh, language, very embellished, highly sophisticated language. So Shakespeare's plays required a more natural kind of, more uh, conversational kind of uh, delivery. And again, we, we go back to Shakespeare and Hamlet and Horatio and this very beautiful relationship Hamlet says, when he sees him, give me that man that is not passion's slave, 
and I will wear him in my heart's core, I in my heart of heart, as I do thee. You are not a slave of passion. You are a man of reason, Horatio. You are a true friend, Horatio. And I will wear you. I will put you in the core of my heart, in my heart's core, in my heart of heart. Beautiful expression, as I do thee, Horatio. Because we remember everybody abandoned. His mother, his father, his mother, his uncle, his childhood friends, his beloved uh, Ophelia, everybody uh, conspired against him except Horatio, who, who remained uh, constant. And he tells him the plan, watch the king. If the king's guilt is not moved, then this is a damned ghost that we saw. Otherwise, it's an honest ghost, like he suggested before. So the interesting thing about this Hamlet praising Horatio, bringing him even closer to him again, brings something about Hamlet that we should always think about. He's a good friend. He's a good guy. He gets angry. He gets frustrated. He, he shouts. He mocks people. He turns and he goes crazy, usually reacting to people who betray, uh, betray him. And, and I love how Horatio tries to modestly shrug him. No, come on, don't stop complimenting me, uh, Hamlet. But Hamlet doesn't let it, uh, let it go. Horatio is the one decent person left in life when everybody else is uh, betraying uh, Hamlet. And Hamlet wants this loyalty. He wants this honesty in his life in a world turned upside down. And again, this quote, this beautiful quote, how he's going to wear him in his heart of heart, in his heart. Uh, uh, core. Horatio's dignity and honor are painted clearly. He stands in contrast to everyone, like Claudius, like Gertrude, like Rosencrantz, Godelson, and even uh, Ophelia. And the plan is uh, to watch the king for any sign of, uh, uh, of guilt. Hamlet may not trust himself completely. And I love this about Hamlet, how he he's a scholar, remember? University, he wants evidence, he wants concrete evidence, he wants scientific evidence, and he wants somebody else, somebody whom he trusts, to, uh, to, to either say yes or no, agree or disagree. With Horatio, he can reach to that conclusion, and he knows will be a fair judgment of uh, 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 Claudius's guilt or, or innocence. <clears throat> When Polonius comes to the stage to watch before the, the, the dumb show, the murder of Gonzago, the play within play, he says something interesting. Hamlet asks him, did you ever play? Did you ever act? And he says, yes, I played, I did enact Julius Caesar. And twice he uses the word, I was killed. Brutus killed me. And Shakespeare makes fun, Hamlet makes fun of, of him here. I, it was brute of him. So he's playing on Brutus and Brute, punning on this, but to kill him. This could foreshadow something. So I, I played a part and I was killed, probably foreshadowing the death of somebody we'll see, no spoilers. Although we did so many spoilers, because you already know the play and watched it. So this scene uh, has dramatic foreshadowing. Twice it was mentioned that Claudius was killed in a play he he, in a role he, uh, he played. And notice how Hamlet is again uh, uh, targeting this man, taunting him and, and, and trying to humiliate him. He doesn't hes hesitate to make fun of him all the time. Uh, such harassment is embarrassing and uncomfortable. Perhaps that is the intention of Hamlet. He wants to embarrass and make this old man, old fool, uh, who's using his, 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 his daughter, who, who, who forced his daughter to stop loving. Uh, Hamlet. Even Hamlet's mother was not safe from his barbs and insults. He was openly scornful towards Gertrude and, and, and Ophelia. And this is part of the interaction. Uh, Hamlet says, uh, again, playing on word, uh, uh, like punning and wordplay, lady, shall I lie in your lab? She says, no, my lord. And then he says, I mean, my head upon your lab, not something else. And uh, when he says, do you think I meant country matters? In a sense, like being intimate with you. And, and see, he says again, kind of rejecting, repelling him, like she said, she said I think nothing, uh, my Lord. And then 
when he keeps, you know, being this in, uh, funny, sarcastic, witty, he says, you are merry, my lord. But I don't think that she means it like being merry, like you're losing it in, in a sense. Look at how she is saying no to him. She is being for probably the second time after her uh, soliloquy, being uh, strong, resisting his uh, attempts to, uh, to make fun of her. <clears throat> and then when Hamlet says something, uh, he, do he doesn't let go of that fact when he says, uh, when he, co he keeps commenting on the play as, it, as it's going, how cheerfully my mother looks. Look, how cheerfully my mother looks and my father died within two hours. It's only been two hours. Remember, this is probably two or three or two or three months after the beginning of the play when he said two months, a little uh, two months, and then he said they used th these met metaphors uh, uh, implying how short the period between the death and the very marriage. And now he's saying two hours. Interesting, she corrects him beautifully. Nay, it is twice two months, meaning four months my lord so long and that that is interesting about about uh, ophelia and then there is the prologue so what they do in the place there's a mime show mime you know acting without uh, uh, without talking without the dialogue without the words the speech acting the scene very quickly and then there is the prologue and prologues were usually very long but this is very brief for us and for our tragedy here, stooping to your clemency, we beg your hearing patiently. And then, is this a prologue or the prosy of a ring? Is this a prologue or an inscription written on a ring? And she agrees here. It is brief, my lord. Yes, it's short. And Hamlet hits back at her as woman's love. It's short as the shortness, the brevity of a woman's love. And then Ophelia, because he keeps commenting on the players and the language and the dialogue and the action, you are a good chorus, my lord. You're good, probably treating him like, like, like a kid. And then he said, I could interpret between you and your love. And she replies also, you are keen, my lord. Like you are merry, you are keen, you are a good chorus. Uh, this is an Ophelia we see for the first time. Remember, in front of her father, in front of her uh, brother, she was not able to speak this freely. And this breaks our heart even more. It, clearly, those people are fit for each other, Hamlet and Ophelia. Our hearts break because we see two potential lovers who could have been great people, destroyed in front of our eyes, turned against each other. So Ophelia's uh, a brief exchange with Hamlet uh, 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 sounds distant and clear because she was resisting him, she was rejecting him, she was replying to his insults with, with you know, mocking him and condescending uh, him in a sense. She will not open herself up to him. She's brief. His barbs and needlessly cruel retorts are relentless. He never stops. The dialogue between them is uncomfortable in the extreme and because of that it is tragic. It is tragic because their behavior mirrors the waning, the ending and the lost love portrayed on stage. A love that could have been really, really great. Uh, so his hand it is scornful to everybody and to Ophelia. He's probably angrier at her than anybody else. More at Ophelia, angrier with Ophelia than probably he's with his mother. He comments, uh, his comments to Ophelia are suggestive and insulting, you know, sexual innuendos and, uh, you know, shall I lie in your lap? We know that she doesn't deserve this treatment. We know that Hamlet is, is wrong, he's harsh. This is sexual harassment. This is a, a abuse, stop it, Hamlet. Nobody is justified, even if she was your, your beloved, even if she really does love you and she decided to stop loving you, we need to stop it. 
he impresses us with unnecessarily cruel uh, cruelty uh, uh, cruel uh, being unnecessarily cruel in this in this scene really heartbreaking ophelia seems composed and but again she matches him pun for pun she resists him she replies to him she mocks him she makes fun of him revealing something interesting about her character she counters his insolence with grace and dignity she doesn't use vulgar language or suggestive uh, language she doesn't hesitate to answer him and correct him when he uh, is wrong calmly reminding hamlet that his father has been dead for months not not two uh, two hours and there are other things about uh, suggestive language in in hamlet in, if we go back to the dumb show, I'll, I'll comment on the play within the play. Now, what happens exactly in the play within the play is that Hamlet heard the story from the ghost, and he asked, and there, there, ha there happened uh, uh, to be a story in, in history, the murder of Gonzago, which Hamlet, of course, names uh, the mousetrap, uh, a story that is very similar to this, a king who loves the queen, each promises the other to love uh, the other forever and ever, never to remarry, and to be loyal even if somebody dies. And then one, uh, the king is killed by his brother and he remarries his sister. Sorry, he, his sister-in-law. He remarries the widow, the king's wife, the queen. Which is exactly what the ghost told him. We don't know whether this is what really happened or not. So what Hamid does is that he puts this on the stage. And look at this. Remember, we have a queen and a king on the stage watching a play directed and produced by Hamlet. Even the speech was partly written by Hamlet. The queen had already had lost her uh, husband probably four months ago. And later, two months later, he, uh, she uh, married the king's brother and became the queen. And Hamlet is due, even if like this didn't really happen, even if Hamlet's father was not killed by his, his brother, Hamlet is suggesting that maybe my mother and my uncle are married because they conspired and together they killed my father, the king. It's exactly what happened in real life, which is also, but we don't know, we're not sure about the poison, about the killing, whether Claudius really killed his father, whether Gertrude knew about this or was part of this, or whether the king, the Gertrude and Claudius were in love before the death of King Hamlet. So I think the play is too obvious, too childish even, too simplistic. It's like when you play, when you do a play, like uh, uh, you, you ask your mother and your father for a phone, to buy you a phone or a laptop, and they say no, and you say, okay, mom, dad, I am doing a play, a sketch tomorrow with my brothers and sisters. I want you to watch. And the play goes like this. Uh, a, a, a son or a daughter asks uh, her or his uh, parents for a mobile phone or a laptop. And they say no. And because they say no, they have an accident and they die. Your parents are going to be furious because it's, it's very obvious. You're making fun of them. You're mocking them. Look at the queen, the player queen, what she says in front of the queen and the king and the audience. Again, promising not to remarry. I mean, of course, later on, she remarries very quickly. A second time I kill my husband dead when second husband kisses me in bed. If I get married after your death and this person marries me, kisses me, it means I kill you a second time, every time I am killed. And look at this beautiful couplet here, dead and bed. A second time I kill my husband dead, when second husband kisses me in bed. And which is what happens with Gertrude and, and Claudius. And when the king, and 
So look at the, how simplistic and straightforward and obvious the play is. And Hamlet keeps, uh, keeps taunting the king and keeps mocking everybody and commenting here and there and making, uh, 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 clarifying some points. Aha, uh -huh. you know, I, uh, he says, I think she's not going to marry. I think she's going to marry very quickly. And he asks his mother, a very famous line here, uh, Madam, how like you this play? She says, the lady doth protest too much, methinks. The lady does protest too much, it seems. The queen keeps protesting, you know. And the king says, have you heard the argument? Is there no offense in it? This is very offensive, the play. It's very clear. It's offensive to kings and to queens, to me, to the Gertrude. And Hamlet says, no, no, they do this in jest. What do you call the play? And it is the mouse trap, Masyadatul Fa'r. Interesting <laughs> name to this play. So the play within play in this scene here, it involves the significant changes in character. Hamlet is different. He is lively, he's active, he's, he's in control, yeah? He's in command here. And uh, if, we, if you think of the, the, the stage itself, it's going to change because we need to to have different settings here. We have to have a stage on, on the stage with the different scenery. And we have the audience, remember the audience observing the actors, observing actors. Hamlet observing the king, observing the, 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 the players. We observing Hamlet, observing Claudius, observing interesting uh, developments here. And don't forget that Hamlet is doing this uh, direction and production and even the writing. Uh, some people, if you go here, some people, I just said this, but I want to highlight it again. The actor's lines must be delivered realistically and we, we, uh, uh, in a way to be acceptable, the play uh, to be seen uh, as appealing to, to everybody as a part, as an act, I would say, as a piece of art. Uh, but the, the, the performance seems to be wooden and too artificial, even too bombastic, too artificial, and, and, and too obvious the insult, the similarities here. The similarities are uncanny between the parallel between what the king and the queen and Hamlet play. You can read this, go to it uh, later on. And even uh, this one with the dialogue between Hamlet and King Claudius, and how Hamlet keeps again insulting him, making uh, provoking him, taunting him. So we have two things that Hamlet is actually using. One, the play that is very similar to real life. And two, Hamlet is insulting and taunting and using language in his particular. Look at this example. The king asks Hamlet and he says, how are you Hamlet? And Hamlet says, excellent of the chameleon's dish. I am like a chameleon, you know? Chameleon could have double meaning. One, Claudius is like a chameleon, you know, chameleon herba, that it changes color, adapts to situate different situations. But it also means how the chameleon feeds on air. Hamid could be indicating that he feels as if he doesn't need food because he can feed on something else, on his victory and how he's using the drama to take so the name is the dumb, uh, the mouse uh, trap. Many uh, will describe this as mime, miming, you know, acting without words. Sometimes described as a dumb show, especially the beginning of of the, the the play. The players act out the basic plot, and then there is the prologue, and then there is the play within uh, uh, the play. Uh, and, and after this, <clears throat> where again the king rises and the performance is broken up here, Ophelia first notices, and it's not Hamlet, interesting. The king rises, the king stands up. What? Frighted with, the, with false fire? Really? Is he frightened? Is he offended by performance? Remember, it was Hamlet who said, the play is the thing wherein I catch the, the conscience of the king. It was Hamlet who said, Literature and drama can reveal, can expose people and reveal their reality, reveal their guilt or innocence in the way they react to this performance. So, and now for him, this is fiction. It's like false fire. It's like fire on a picture. 
or a monster on a picture or a lion on a, on a picture. Can you be affrighted, frightened by this? How fares my lord? Polonia says, give over the play. Stop the play. And king says, give me some light away. Light is significant, very metaphorical here. We need light. This is a man who come, who works in the darkness, in the background, but who needs light, protection. And everybody, lights, lights, lights. Wow. So Claudius here notices the parallels. There is an uncanny, very obvious parallels between the play and reality. His guilty conscience has made him suspicious in, in a sense because the similarities are extreme. And remember, this is what Hamlet planned for. The king feels hemmed by the presence in the court and he is provoked by Hamlet's taunts. If he remains, he looks guilty because of how he's going to change in his body language. If he objects, he sounds guilty. So he's stuck. When he's like, you know, Hamlet to be or not to be, to go or not to go. When Hamlet puts Gertrude on the spot by asking her what she thinks of the play, remember, Claudius makes an ineffect attempt to intervene, but his intentions are transparent. And Hamlet, when he says, well, like, what, what, what do you think of the play? And he says, the queen does think, uh, does uh, protest too much, me think. The king says, he intervenes. He doesn't want Hamlet to talk with, with his wife, with his mother. He says, what do you call this play? Is there offense in it? And Hamlet says, the mouse trap. It's like, shut up. You are the mouse. You're not, there's, there's the similarity and you are the mouse here. I'm trapping you. Hamlet explains the murder of, of Gonzago, creating this kind of duel, silent duel between him and, and the king, you know, how he taunts uh, 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 Claudius. Now, Claudius, remember, this is very important here. Claudius was a diplomat, a man of diplomacy. Remember what he did when he became, became a king? He wasn't a man of fighting. He was a man of cunning. He learned the art, the fine art of deceit. He is a master of manipulation and composure. He is steady. His steady uh, demeanor here can, uh, cannot easily be you know, changed by this performance. Uh, but there is internal pressure caused by his guilt, it seems, which in a way, his guilt outweighs the, uh, what, he, what his composure and him trying to maintain his composure in the sense that his feeling of guilt is exposing him. Thanks to Hamlet's very childish, very uh, wooden, very artificial uh, play, and also Hamlet's taunts. The two forces will soon be too much to bear, even for him. So he's a man of diplomacy. He, can, he knows how to control himself. But at the same time, he, he has a conscience that is, 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 is you know, uh, urging him to do something, to change. It's changing him even unconsciously, even without him being able to control this. So as Hamlet watches the king watching the play, he senses the imminent breakdown of the illusion Claudius has created the illusion of composure, the illusion of steadiness, the illusion of, you know, his steady uh, demeanor. Hamlet can read this uh, later on, explaining uh, how this silent duel between them. This is already from your book. You can go back to it. So the secret surfaces, and Claudius realizes that Hamlet knows. But again, we're not certain yet. Nobody has yet confessed. He tried to stop, he, he actually stops the performance. He tries at the beginning to stop it, to change it, to see if there is offense, to divert the attention. And uh, he loses his composure and he stands up and he says, stop, give me light, give me, give me light. And uh, the interesting thing here is that both Hamlet and Horatio come together to discuss, to examine to see if this is really uh, a sign of guilt or, or not. Uh, and there is a, uh, where is it here? Okay, it's uh, Hamlet, when everybody leaves, uh, Hamlet says, a, a whole one I, for thou dost know, O Damon dear, my dear friend, this realm dismantled was of Jove himself and now reigns here. A very, very 
and then there is this dash, meaning there is a silence, there is a pause. Hey, Jock. And Horatio says, you could have rhymed. And it says in the book, and this is interesting, because he, say, he used was, and now he's referring to the king. Now reigns here, the ruler, the king here is. He, he, he wanted to say as to rhyme with was, but he didn't. He changed his mind at the end. And then Horatio says, you, you, you might have rhymed. You could have rhymed. You could have used the word you had in mind. And this is the explanation uh, here. Hamlet, in a, I'll comment on, on Horatio's reaction in a bit, but generally Horatio agrees, yeah, that this is a sign of, of guilt. And then Rosencrantz and Guildenstern come to Hamlet and says, your mother is angry at you because of what you did to, your, uh, to the king and she wants to talk to you. And this is the dialogue, interesting. Look at, uh, oh, good Horatio, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pounds. Don't, not for 290, this 290 is the number of the line. A thousand pounds, did you perceive, did you see, did you see how he, how he react? And Horatio is like, very well, my lord, very well. Upon the talk of the poisoning, when we mentioned the poisoning, when the player king wanted to poison the player, the other player king, I did very well note him. Again, there is a clear accusation here. Whether Claudius did kill Hamlet, old Hamlet, or not. A king, somebody, somebody's brother, the king's brother, poisoning the king to become the king and marry his wife. This is very similar to reality. Even if Claudius didn't do this, he would be furious. And I don't know, in a, I don't, since the Horatio agrees 100%, he's, he's kind, kind he's being pushed a little bit by, by Hamlet. Did you see? I'll take your friend says I'll take, uh, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pounds. And he says, yeah, very well, very well, my lord. Upon mentioning talking of poisoning, I did very well note him. So both agree, but in my understanding, Hamlet coerces, forces Horatio to say yes to agree with him. <clears throat> And when Hamlet is late for his mother, Polonius again is sent by Gertrude and Hamlet mocks him yet again. And I love this about Hamlet. No matter what he's doing, when he sees Polonius, he mocks him. And remember, Polonius represents the, the, the hypocrite politicians, the horrible politicians who just care about themselves and don't care about people or their even sometimes family members. We, we've seen how he destroyed Hamlet and Ophelia and their relationship. And remember the scene before Polonius promised the king to hide in Gertrude's chamber, her room, her bedroom, to hide and spy on Hamlet and the queen. So Polonius says, my lord, the queen would speak with you and presently now. And then Hamlet changes the topic. Do you see yonder, yonder over there, the cloud that's almost the shape of a camel? Look at that cloud, it looks like a camel. He, Pretends madness again. And Polonius says, by the mass, it is like a camel indeed. Oh, yes, it is indeed like a camel. And Hamlet says, methinks it is like a weasel. You know, the weasel, the little like a squirrel, like a, a rat. He says, it is back. Like he changes his mind. He's playing with him. He's playing him. It is like a weasel. And Hamlet says, or like a whale. And Polonius says, very like a whale. Again, this is a politician who changes his mind every now and then. This must be hilarious after this intensely dramatic scene on the stage comes a little bit of dramatic relief of, of humor and, 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 and comedy. Hamlet is told that his mother and the king are in marvelous, are marvelously distempered. They're angry because of Hamlet's uh, insults. And then Hamlet justifies this. Is he distempered because he's drinking? He tells Guildenstern and uh, Guildenstern and Rosencrantz. And he, Hamlet, is happy to hear that the king uh, is distempered with choler, that he's angry because this is what Hamlet wants uh, to hear. He tells them to, re to report this to a doctor. If he is angry, go to the doctor. Any assistance he might give the king would only make Claudius's condition 
uh, was. Gertrude has sent these two friends and Hamlet wants to go, has to go to the chamber. When he doesn't go quickly, Polonius is sent to him and again, he ridicules Polonius uh, 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 heavily like we've just seen. We are reminded here by Rosencrantz that Hamlet is next in line to the throne. He reminds him of this, but doesn't change a thing about Hamlet. Hamlet is now uh, set on revenge. And that he took, he, Hamlet has the king's voice, his vote. When the king dies, Hamlet is to be king, but that doesn't change. So why are you mean to the king, to the queen, when you are next in line? Hamlet doesn't care. Hamlet doesn't care, it seems, about the throne, about the being king. He wants more than the crown. He wants revenge. It says here, the crown is not among his ambitions, at least now. He wants revenge. And again, Gertrude is angry. We've seen how Hamlet also made fun of her. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about how, for some critics, Hamlet is after the queen first and then after the king. We'll see this. So after, again, uh, repeating this just to emphasize that, that the relation, what happened between Hamlet and, and Horatio when the performance breaks up, Hamlet is euphoric, he's happy. He's, extremely happy because his, his plan worked and he is convinced that Claudius's conscience has been touched and that he, now he has evidence, especially that his friend Horatio agreed that he changed, he acted like a guilty person. And he says, I'll take the ghost's word for a thousand pounds. Horatio, and this is where this source shows that Hamlet, Horatio is not 100% agreeing but he is, you know, because Hamlet is his friend, he says, okay, yes, yes. Horatio's judgment seems careful and guarded. He's a little bit critical of Hamlet's performance. Significantly, Hamlet returns away from Horatio to talk to, when, 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 when Horatio criticizes him, like, but you did this, you shouldn't have done this. He leaves him, he makes fun of Rosencrantz and Guildenstern. And when they leave, he makes fun of Polonius. He doesn't want, uh, uh, Horatio to be critical of him. He wants somebody to agree with him. In his advice to the actors, remember, and his declaration of his love for Horatio, Hamlet asserts super the superiority of restraint, controlling your feelings, you know, your emotions, or and discretion over passion, which in a sense is exactly the opposite of what Hamlet did in previous soliloquies, especially in Act Two, uh, Scene Two. Commenting on the dumb. Uh, show the, the play within play, the murder of Contago. Now, there, there are two important points here. In a sense, it says here this source I, I gave you, critics have been puzzled by the fact that Claudius and Gertrude seem unaffected by the dumb show. Dim show. At the beginning, they weren't that affected. Uh, uh, why? Why didn't they react angrily? when they see something similar to their relationship, the death of a king uh, by his brother, and then uh, the wife marries the brother and they become king and queen. Number one, the king, King Claudius is a man of uh, diplomacy. He is the master of concealing his guilt. He can do it, he's the king. He managed to kill his brother. He married his, and probably there was a relationship before. It is not that Claudius is not affected by the show. He is affected by the show. It is that he doesn't want to show that he's affected. He doesn't want to reveal his emotions. He doesn't want to change his facial expression. So Hamlet doesn't uh, uh, suspect something. Gertrude has no reason to be upset by the mind. Nothing, the mind that came before the prologue, the dumb show, she has nothing to be upset. There, to her, there is no similarity between her life and the show. Because later on in the next scene, we are going to know to be told that she has no idea about the murder of her first husband, that uh, King Hamlet was actually killed by Claudius. She has no idea. The question is, were Claudius and Gertrude adulterous lovers before the king, before King Hamlet was killed? 
Were they in a relationship before the death of old Hamlet? Common sense suggests so. Some critics say yes, and some go even further and further. Probably I'll we'll get back to this. But that means the dumb show would convince Gertrude the play is not about her. So the play is not about here because in the in the dumb show there is no previous relationship between the brother and the queen the brother kills the king and then he marries the queen but in the dumb show that's the dumb show in real life it seems that there was a relationship the queen was in love with with the brother before so it's clear hamlet is after number one the conscience of his mother first to reveal, to try to see if she was in love, she was cheating on his father before his death even or not, to see whether she was part of this plan, whether she helped Claudius in a way to kill King Claudius. And that is interesting. Not many people talk about this. And then in other words, the play is an indictment of Gertrude's infidelity and complicity. Infidelity, her cheating on her husband, and complicity, to what extent did she help Claudius kill her first husband? It also seems that Hamlet wants to provoke the king into action. And I find this very interesting. Hamlet didn't only do the play. He uh, wanted to provoke the king into taking action, probably holding a sword, attacking Hamlet. So when Hamlet kills him, it is justified and it happens in front of people. When Claudius rises, it is unclear whether Hamlet, we don't know. Was he angry because of the play? Or was he ham angry because of Hamlet's taunts and provocations? Or both, probably both. It seems the play has not proved Claudius' guilt as suggested by some critics and films. We don't have strong evidence. Sorry, Hamlet. I can make a play like this and make you very angry, Hamlet. The fifth soliloquy to end this uh, session, the last, there is a brief uh, moment when Hamlet is alone and he goes, recites his fifth soliloquy, very brief, very active, very telling, in which he is full of revenge, very angry, but a man of action now because he has the word of the ghost, the word of Horatio, to his friend, the evidence, the conscience of the king was touched. He has, he has evidence. He has scientific, practical, concrete evidence. Unlike the Hamlet we've seen in the previous scenes and soliloquies, he was a man of words, a man of thinking, a man of, of thought, a man of conscience, a man of meditation, a man of hesitation, of sloth, to be or not to be, to do or not to do. He has experienced a change in his spirit, the transformation here that took place, his you know, fundamental and radical transformation. The plan itself, the play itself, the plan. Now he is hardened and ready to do the battle, not with his soul, but with the, um, soul and words and, you know, soliloquies, with the flesh and blood of his stepfather, the king. He's ready to kill now. First, but interestingly, Hamlet doesn't go to kill the king, to look for the king. First, he has to face his mother. Uh, uh, he, he wants to tell her the truth. He wants to ask her if she was part of, of, of the murder. And this is the beautiful, beautiful uh, speech by Hamlet, considered by some to be his fifth soliloquy. Is now the very witching time of night when churchyards yawn and hell itself breathes out contagion to this world. What a beautiful expression. The churchyards, Makbara, yawn, the Tasa'ab. And hell itself breathes out contagion, com, uh, contagion uh, infection, contagious. There's a movie called Contagion about a virus like the coronavirus and COVID-19. Now I could I drink hot blood. Not only blood, hot blood. I can kill him and drink his blood. Probably not literally, like Hunter says. وَإِنِّي قَدْ شَرِبْتُ دَمَ الْأَعَادِ بِأَقْحَافِ الرُّؤُوسِ وَمَا رَوِيتُ Not going to literally do it and do such bitter business, the revenge, as the day would quake to look on so. And he says, but I'll calm down. He, instead of going quickly to the king, 
now to my mother. He says, the soul of Nero. Nero is a, a king, a Roman king who killed his own mother. Nairun in Arabic, who also burnt Rome. And he says, I'm first going to my mother, but I'm not going to kill her. Remember that the ghost told Hamlet, don't kill your mother. Let me be cruel, not unnatural. I'm going to be tough, but I'm not going to kill her. And he says his beautiful line here, I will speak daggers to her, but use none. I'm not going to kill her to use a dagger, a sword, a knife, but I'll speak like daggers. And this is a beautiful metaphor in which words are more like daggers. My tongue and soul in this be hypocrites and into the beautiful couplet again. How in my words soever she be shent to give them seals, never my soul consent. I'm turning my words into, into action. So the euphoria Hamlet has, you know, the, the happiness, the sheer utter happiness Hamlet has is reflected in, in his decision, resolution to take action, to kill. At the end, Hamlet's euphoria becomes even melodramatic. It is now the very witching time of night. Now could I drink hot blood? Yet his next blood is not to pursue Claudius, to go after him, but to visit his mother. I'll speak the gods to her, but use none. And there is a cruel irony here. I'm sorry I'm spoiling this. But the irony is that he is going to literally use a dagger in his mother's chamber. Who's he going to use it against? Who's he going to kill? We'll see next uh, next session. I'll stop now. And please, if you have any question or comment, you can always ask uh, me anywhere or particularly on, uh, uh, on the Facebook group where I post this uh, video. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, and see you soon.